Welcome to Running For Real, a global community with a shared love and curiosity for running. Together we reconnect with the reasons why we love to run and discover ways it helps us become better people. Whether it's the quiet moments of a morning run while the rest of the world still sleeps, or befriending the strangers next to you at the start line of a race. We are here to connect with others who see running as the common thread that weaves our lives together. Come join me, Tina Muir, as I talk with people from all walks of life, united by a love of running. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Running For Real podcast. I am excited today that we are going to reshare an episode from the past, uh, an episode with Chris Mosier. And the reason we wanted to reshare this episode is in light of recent events at Colorado Springs, in light of a lot of what is happening right now that is really some nasty, cruel stuff uh, we are seeing towards the LGBTQ plus community um, and especially the trans community. Um, We did have a different interview scheduled, but we have decided to reshare this episode. Chris is really thoughtful and uh, honest and just easy to listen and learn to. And uh, for that reason, we wanted to put this as our episode for this week. And next week, we will get back to our regular scheduled episode. So I hope you enjoy this episode. If you have already listened to it, it will be a great refresher. Uh, But if not, take a listen and uh, let's go meet Chris. Hi friends, quickly interrupting this episode to just talk to you a little bit about Patreon. I know, I've been talking about Patreon a lot lately, and I gotta be honest, it really has humbled me in that I have been posting, I've been sharing, and I haven't really seen many people responding to a lot of the things, the a lot of bonus materials that I am adding. And while I know those are valued, and many of you have said you really appreciate those extra things, I also wonder if maybe I was putting a bit too much pressure on you with these extra travel together runs, with these Zoom chats, with these extra blog posts, your suggestions for podcast guests, your questions you wanted to ask for weekly strides, a shout out on a together run. There are a lot of things that I am offering here that it suddenly dawned on me might just be overwhelming. Actually, it didn't dawn on me. I'll be honest. I had emails coming in from multiple people who are in Patreon who say, I love supporting you. I love that I give you the opportunity to continue what you do, but I just don't have the time or the bandwidth to enjoy all these additional bonus things. So I just want to remind you that there is a, what we call a keeping it real level, which is $3 per month. You don't get any bonuses that are going to overwhelm you and feel like you have to find time you don't have time for to make it worthwhile. You also don't have to uh, do anything. It is just a way of supporting me and the Running For Real team for, I mean, that what's that, like half a coffee these days? I think a coffee is like $5 in most places. But if you want to just go to patreon.com forward slash running for real, that's the number four, running for real.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash running for real. It's also in the show notes. You can just support Running For Real at the Keeping It Real level or the Together Team level, which just gives you those travel together runs. Now, that is a way, a massive way that you can help me and support me. And if you pay annually, there's a big discount there. I just want to remind you that it doesn't, I maybe have been pushing all these bonuses and talking about all these extra things you get. But if it works better for you just to chip in a little bit to help me support all the work that I'm doing, that means a lot too. You don't have to go up to the top level. So I just wanted to be real with you for a minute here and um, and say thank you. To those of you who are supporters on Patreon, it means so much. Thank you, friends, and uh, let's get back to the episode. Chris, thank you so much for joining me today on the Running Fuel podcast. This feels overdue. I feel like I should, I feel like you and I should have connected like five years ago at least, but I'm kind of embarrassed that it's only happening now, but I, <laughs> I am excited better late than ever. Yes, I agree. I actually don't know how it didn't happen before. Mm-hmm. Uh, like in all things considered, it's a small running world. We definitely should have done it, but I'm I'm happy to be here. 
Yeah, I uh, I definitely take full responsibility for that. But uh, I'm excited you are here. And I've given you a bit of a rundown before we started recording here. But for my listeners, uh, I want to spend the first part of this episode educating. And keep in mind, Chris would have been asked these questions hundreds of times before. And so, Chris, I apologize. Um, <laughs> but and I, and I want to uh, send people actually to my episode with Amelia Gappin in ep- episode 65. So that was years ago. Um, mm. I asked her a lot of these questions. Um, and so I will, uh, if you are confused about something, go back to that episode with Amelia because that may well uh, unlock some things for you. Or, you know, you could do your own effort here and do some Googling, do some reading up. Um, but Chris, I might stop you to explain things along the way if we need to, so people can use this as a platform for them to hopefully go on to do their own research and learn things. Um, And um, after we've gone through a brief overview of the basics, we'll go deeper and get into some other things that hopefully haven't covered before. So to start with, uh, as with other conversations I've had in the past for my listeners, I may get things wrong. Uh, Chris may need to correct me, but just as someone in your life may need to correct you for saying something wrong. uh, We have to get beyond being afraid of these uncomfortable conversations, being called out and getting defensive as we sometimes can. So I'm working on it and I want to give permission to everyone listening here. And Chris, maybe you could speak to this, that it's okay to make mistakes and say the wrong thing if you are trying and if you're working on it rather than just staying quietly on the sidelines and never putting any effort in. Would you like to maybe speak to that before we get into anything? Oh, absolutely. You don't know what you don't know, Mm -hmm. right? And so you don't know what you don't know. You can do your best. And if somebody says, hey, there's actually a better way to do this, um, then then you know. And then it's your responsibility to internalize that, to to know better and do better, as they say, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But I think a lot of us are inhibited in having these conversations for that fear of getting it wrong. And it's important to note that, you know, in getting it wrong, your intent of trying to do good or trying to be helpful or be an ally doesn't necessarily erase the hurt of a, of a statement of a, of a misstep, right? So like there's this idea of intent versus impact. Um, so our intent might be good, but the impact of that statement might still be hurtful. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just important for us to acknowledge that hurt, uh, that we might have caused and then vow to do better. Right. So like that fear of doing wrong because someone might get hurt by what I say, shouldn't prevent us from trying to do our best to step in and be an ally. And so if someone does say something and they can sense just through knowing that person or maybe just through, you know, basic understanding of body language that they have said something hurtful, is it, is it best to just address it and say, I'm sorry that hurt you? Or I'm sorry, what are some words people could use if they do take a misstep? Yeah. Sorry is great. (laughs) You know, I think (laughs) about it like in terms of misgendering, which is one of the most common things that happens in the trans community is misgendering is when someone says she instead of he or uh, says he or she instead of they for somebody's pronouns that they use. And when we're in a case like that, uh, you know, I always found like when it happened to me when I was transitioning, so for your listeners, and I'm sure there's an intro, but I'm a trans man. I was assigned female at birth, raised and socialized as female, and in 2010 transitioned to male. I identify as a trans man. I use he, him pronouns. In that first part of transition, some people still called me she. And and as someone who was trying to establish myself in, in the world in a way that other people would respond to me in the way that I saw myself, when people did that, it was really hurtful. And the best thing that they could do in that case was just acknowledge they made a mistake and then correct it. So if they were like, um, yeah, she said that it was at five o'clock and the Sorry, he said it was at five o'clock and like just that it, it didn't take the, the full sting out of their statement. Um, and it, it didn't take away my own questioning of myself and what I was doing wrong. But in that case, it, 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 it gave me some confidence that they were going to try to get it right. Mm-hmm. And is there a part of overcomplicating that? Like I know myself, I definitely tend to ramble and w- would that be... That's bad. Like, <laughs> or, like, just 
I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't mean to move on rather than I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. And I should have said this and I, I, re- I really wasn't thinking and I was yeah, trying to. You know. <laughs> so the biggest thing was that like, it was very uncomfortable for me when other people got my pronouns wrong um, mm-hmm. or said something like that because it felt like the spotlight was totally on me. So then when, when say you would start to ramble and explain it away, right. Which is what part Mm -hmm. of that was. I didn't mean to, and what this came in my mind. And I was just looking at her when I said she, but I really meant you Mm -hmm. and he, and you know, all of that rambling is, it seems first like an excuse cover up, right? Like it's not an authentic apology. It's, it's more like trying to explain what you did to defend yourself Mm -hmm. as opposed to just acknowledging the hurt that it caused and then correcting it. And so I was always grateful when people would just make a quick, um, you know, and then if you want to apologize to me later on, do it on the side when we are alone, <laughs> not in the group setting, right? Um, mm-hmm. Because a lot of that, I felt a lot of a lot of shame about uh, when people would misgender me or say things in public and, and have those situations. I felt like it was my fault. And yeah. I think a lot of trans people kind of feel the burden, uh, you know, the, the weight of that burden um, when things like that happen. Yes, for sure. Thank you. And and you mentioned there about pronouns, and this is quite a you know a fundamental part of this conversation we're having here. But for many people, they may not have they may only just be hearing of um, she, her, them, their this pronouns conversation. So, can you explain the uh, the the reasoning behind that? The 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 gentle nature that people should be approaching this with. You've already given some of that, but just for someone who's totally confused by where this has come from maybe they've been raised in a very traditional family who's never never heard of this before uh can you just to give a little more insight into that well we all learn pronouns when we're younger in terms of parts of speech and a pronoun is how we refer to other people when they're not in the room mm-hmm. uh so a couple of different you know she her he him those are common pronouns more recently they them has been approved by the dictionary to say that even though it is plural, it can refer to one singular person. And so there are people who use they or them as their pronouns. They don't use he, they don't use she. There are many other pronouns beyond that. Some people just use their name and no pronouns, but a pronoun is how we refer to someone when they're not there or if we're talking about them. So we all have this, but for many people, specifically cisgender people, it's assumed that people will know what our pronoun is. And we use she, her with feminine presenting people or with people assigned female at birth. We use he, him with more traditionally more masculine presenting people or people who were assigned male at birth. And so we just sort of make assumptions about people's pronoun when we meet them. And this is something that we don't do like, consciously. We we do this just you know naturally. Like this is just something that we've learned. But mm-hmm. there's a problem in that because pronouns are personal and people may have different pronouns than what you assume them to to have. And so you've seen probably in the last six months, as everything has sort of shifted digitally, this larger push for people to put their pronouns in the bio of their social media or in the tagline of their email or in uh, in the window of their digital meeting platform so that people can see what your pronouns are and then address you appropriately. And this is not just for for transgender or non-binary people. This is for everyone. And it's specifically helpful if cisgender people and allies do it because it opens up space for everyone to be addressed how they want to be addressed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Um, And I think that was well worth addressing as I think that's something that um, many people listening may not have had that conversation or may have thought about doing it, but then thought, oh, that's only for people in the trans community or in the LBGTQIA community, not me. Um, So I think, thank you for for making that clear that we should all be doing this. And uh, you can go watch me after this conversation. I'll I'll make sure I do that too, at least (laughs) show other people that they can too. Um, Okay. So You've mentioned many times before in other podcasts, uh, you and I think you even said at the beginning here that you knew at the age of four that your gender identity did not match your biological sex, which means you felt your your gender was a male, but your biology at birth was female. Now, I'm not going to ask you how you knew that, but for someone listening who has a child, they suspect may feel this way, that their gender and um, biology do not match um, right now. Uh, 
but they, you know, they've maybe confided in friends and they've said, oh, it's just a phase. Um, so give some advice for someone listening who gets the sense that their child may be, may be feeling this way, but maybe isn't confident enough or isn't sure of what's going on to say something to them yet. Well, I just want to clarify. I think if age four was where I first had this sort of idea about gender and okay. started to recognize where I was being treated, treated differently than my brother for example, okay. and okay. from the other kids in my neighborhood. But I can honestly say I didn't have any clue about my gender identity until well out of high school uh, into being an adult that I just always felt sort of like me. And I didn't, I didn't feel like I knew that I wasn't like my peers, but I didn't know, you know, what my identity was or put much other thought into it. I knew I wasn't like the girls in my class, but I also knew I wasn't like my brother exactly. So mm -hmm. I, I just sort of felt like I had occupied my own space. And I think I did a lot of things to keep myself busy so that I didn't really have to put a lot of thought into that. Mm -hmm. And sport was definitely one of those things that I dove into to occupy a lot of that time and, and that mental energy so that I didn't have to think about my gender. But I just want to be clear about that. Like I, yeah. I would never say that I knew I was a man when I was a kid. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I sort of had this vision of what I'd grow up to be that didn't align with being a, identified as a young girl, but I wasn't sure about the path to get there. And so I think there was this, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that easy of a process and it certainly wasn't mm -hmm. clear to me at age four. But with that said, I think now with more visible representation, more understanding of the trans community and more people open to the possibility of people being themselves at a younger age, we are seeing people who are four years old, know exactly who they are, tell their mm -hmm. parents like, no, mom, I'm a little boy. And you know, we're seeing young people transition at a younger age or start hormone blockers and uh, puberty blockers and, and start to transition in high school. And so that, that sort of has shifted from the time that I came out and from my experience, certainly as a young person. Yeah. In and, um, yeah, go on. Oh, go for it. in terms of it being a phase, you had mentioned that, that yeah. term of it's a phase. And I think we all have a, a strong sense of who we are as young people. And I think it's not until older people, specifically parents, coaches, teachers, adults in our lives. And then, and then certainly with some influence of our peers, we sort of get that knocked out of us at a certain point, telling us that we should conform to sort of this middle median, you know, quote unquote, norm of society. And so I think a lot of people who do know their identity at a younger age are sort of told that they should, that it should be a phase, that, they're, that they'll grow out of it or that it's not real and that it's not authentic. But I would argue that young people know exactly who they are and they just need that support from people in their lives to explore that identity and for some people, they may decide that transition is not for them, that that they aren't transgender, that they're non-binary and, and want to pursue a different path or that they identify fully as a woman or as a man. And that's and that's their future life. But for those folks who are exploring their identity, coming to understand their sense of self and how they want to exist in this world, I think the best thing that we can do is just give those people the space and support to explore that so that they can live a happy, a happy and safe life, regardless of their identity. Mm -hmm. Do you think it is possible for looking into the future and in, I don't even want to say an ideal world because that's not realistic, but as we are growing as a society, I just, I think a lot about my, my two-year-old about to turn three, we'll be three by the time this comes out. Um, and she, I mean, there's a video, I don't think you would have seen it, but I've got a video of her say singing, I love me in the mirror and she's just looking at her part. I love my smile. I love my eyes. And, and, um, you know, I look at her and I think, wow, like, I love that you can look at yourself in the mirror and just mean that from the bottom of your heart. Do you think it is possible for a kid to not lose that sense of truly believing in who they are in the society that we have right now? Do you think it's, it's possible for a child or do you think the way we're set up that sense of um, self-esteem and self-love and belief is just destined to kind of be chipped away by the world that we live in. 
Well, the odds are certainly stacked against them, right? <laughs> it, it would really take, and you're asking a dude who's not a parent. So like, this is my yeah. totally not, yes, yes, know, yes. I have, I have two bunnies <laughs> and they love themselves as far as yes, I know. I <laughs> uh, uh, in terms of, in terms of kids though, I think that it takes that strong support network and, and, you mm -hmm. know, that idea that, that picture that just came to mind as you were telling that story about your daughter saying, I love me. I think that that would have to happen day after day after day after day. And that affirmation of being like, no, you're awesome. Like mm -hmm. you're perfect how you are. I remember being younger and having a, my 12 year old cousin who was stick thin, like could hide behind a seatbelt. You know, it was so tiny saying that her thighs were fat. And I was just heartbroken seeing, seeing that she was influenced by the magazines that her peers were reading and from her how friends in school. I, uh, I must have been probably just before 20 years old, maybe. Okay. This was okay. years ago. But, and I think it's just gotten worse with, with social media, with the com constant comparison of other people. I think it'd be very difficult. And I'm, I'm always just so grateful that social media wasn't around when I was younger okay. because I see, okay. even as an adult, like I just had a great article posted about me yesterday and the comments underneath it are just atrocious. Oh no! I don't Just read them. Horrendous. Don't stay away and, from those things. Ugh. And yeah, and, and so my my personal policy is never read the comments. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, if you're tagged or if it pops up, there's just no way around it. And mm -hmm. it, I would think that it would it would take a lot of affirmation and support. It's certainly possible to encourage a young person to really truly love themselves, but I think that that has to be a daily practice. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, I intend on, on making that the case, but I'm hoping that the reason I ask that is listeners, you can think about the way that you, I've mentioned this so many times before, the way that you talk about yourself in front of your own children, the way that you talk about yourself or the things that you say in front of your nieces, your nephews, uh, kids that are walking around in the store as you happen to go past talking about losing weight. It, it really uh, does come from everywhere. And the more we can change the narrative, I think the better off we're going to be. And did you hear, overhear any conversations when you were younger, you said about kind of knowing that you didn't fit into essentially the two options there were at the time. Um, do you remember overhearing any conversations that were, that were hurtful that made you um, feel as though something was wrong with you or were, were your parents very supportive and loving towards you even at a young age? I don't remember specifically hearing conversations about other people, but I remember how profoundly the media impacted me. And mm -hmm. it was something that probably didn't even cross the minds of the folks that I was around, my parents or, you know, babysitters or anybody else who had a television on. But when Jerry Springer and Maury Povich, for those younger listeners who don't know who those two people are, they're a daytime talk show hosts who kind of did a scandalous sort of shows they would have these shows about transgender people and and most often it was uh some sort of reveal so it was like mm -hmm. some sort of trickery or deception My that's not a woman a that's girlfriend. a man yes and and that sort of thing and i remember being really really harmed by that as a young person not because i i didn't know that that was me i didn't know that i was trans. I didn't know that I could have been on that stage and, you know, in that situation. I just remember internalizing that into this sort of deep internal transphobia that that I then carried with me of being so fearful that I would be treated like the people on those stages. And I, I remember seeing trans people represented in movies and it being the butt of a joke. It was comedy. It was some sort of vomiting scene or I'm thinking about Ace Ventura pet detective for some oh, reason yeah, yeah. there you know it was those were the it was the plot twist it was the aha gotcha and it was you know something that was disgusting for people and so I remember taking all of that in and I'm sure that I heard anti-trans slang and language that slurs that were happening as well that were not stopped or interrupted by people in my family or in you know my parents' social circles. So all of that, while none of it was actually targeted at me, certainly you know, made me go within myself and, and say, hey, we need some 
probably walls for protection right now. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, that, I mean, I take it you've seen the, the documentary Disclosure. Yeah, absolutely. This is yeah. your homework for anybody listening. If you have yes. not seen this, it's on Netflix and it is so incredibly helpful to unpack mm -hmm. some of these messages that we've received about trans people over the years. For sure. And they, they mentioned in there, I mean, there was a few things that stuck out to me. I remember them saying about 80% um, of Americans do not personally know someone who is trans. So most of the information that they are getting is coming from media. Uh, and that in itself, I mean, if we if I, I want to ask the listeners for a minute, um, it's important to think about that. Like how much of what we learned about ourselves is through seeing someone that you resonate with on the screen or in the magazine or some version of media. Uh, and that's people that look like you, people that make you feel like you connect with them. And um, Chris, you know about my second podcast coming later this month with Knox Robinson and representation is going to be our first episode because it's so critical and important and just something to frame the rest of the series. But for someone listening uh, who thinks, well, that's not really the case. Uh, media isn't that much of a role in my life. I think that really, <laughs> like your privilege is showing essentially, like you, um, uh, that's a good way of knowing that you have had a lot of privilege if you don't, aren't aware of that. So in Disclosure, they talked about um, trans people looking for people uh, like who resonated with them when they were younger. Um, and one of the things that it talked about was um, what you were saying just there about how remembering watching movies and watching these uh, kind of being the butt of jokes, but looking at their family members or remembering the specific details of how it made them feel because they something with them connected in that. But as you said, it was always the... Um, always made into the laughing stock or yeah, you, like you said, the big reveal. Um, mm -hmm. So tell us about why it is important to have more trans people in the media. Um, and you were obviously doing a great job with that of, um, you know, sharing your story, getting people to get to know you and love you. Uh, I don't know a single person who knows who you are, who has not been inspired by you um, in, in every way. So uh, tell us about why, more of that matters. And I think, again, in that documentary, they said something about that, then the clumsy representation doesn't matter as much because it's not all there is. That's not all there is to see. That's so important. That's such a good pull out. And I, I had forgotten about that part, but it's so true. And I was having a conversation with someone on Twitter, and this is always a bad way to start a story. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> this is always a dangerous way. It's end so well. <laughs> yesterday, this this great article came out about me on CBS News, and they have quite a following. Uh, and a lot of the folks who came through were just commenting negative or hateful or transphobic things. Lots of slurs, lots of photos, lots of all sorts of stuff that were just intended to harm. And it wasn't from a place very clearly. And this is again, Twitter. So, mm. but Twitter is a microcosm of our society for sure. Mm. The people who, who did take the time to post were largely the negative side. So it's kind of the same with reviews of restaurants, right? People are very, very quick to say the things they didn't like, but not always quick to give the compliments or recommend this restaurant. So that's sort of what I was experiencing there. And I had some, somebody come through with just some real basic uh, misunderstandings about trans people and about trans people in sports. And so I actually did take the time to respond to them with a couple of facts and just kind of straighten out the statements that they were making. And we had a pretty good exchange, but they, I had mentioned that it's because of things like this, where a person says that trans people shouldn't be in sports or should be in their own third category or, um, calling trans women men and saying that they're men trying to cheat and play women's sports so that they can get a medal. Those are the sort of false statements that negatively impact us and not just in sport, but also in society, in the way that people treat us outside of sport. Mm -hmm. Because if those are the only messages that you are getting, that we are cheaters, that we're deceptive, deceitful, hiding something, trying to cheat the system, you know, hurt other people, then that's the opinion people have of us. And yeah. that translates directly in the trans community, not just to harassment and discrimination, but also to deadly violence. And so I was trying to bridge that gap for the person to, and they were like, oh, you're being emotional about it. 
it's not being emotional. It is literally life and death for people in terms of how even even how a media story comes out. So when we have these stories that are talking about us in negative terms and we're in this Twitter society, this scrolling through Instagram or Facebook and just reading the headlines, if all we're seeing is negative commentary about trans people, then that's going to shape our vision and our understanding of trans people, especially if you're not one of the 20% of people in the country who actually know someone who's trans. Mm -hmm. And so it's, yeah. it's really, really dangerous. Sure. And I, I would imagine in some level you begin to internalize uh, when you hear it enough, you begin to think, well, is that who I am? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing, but I imagine it'd I think be hard start, to ignore it. Okay. You know, at the start of my transition, I think I was a lot more... Um, a lot more permeable to taking in other people's stuff and, mm -hmm. and hearing what they were saying and questioning myself. Like, what am I doing wrong that people won't acknowledge me and say he, or what am I doing wrong that people are going to make the comments about, you know, me as an athlete in, in this specific way. And then what I realized over time is that I am not responsible for anybody else's thoughts or opinions. And the only, th I can't control that. I can't, what other people think of me is none of my business. What I can control is how I respond. And, and so like, that's really been the way that I've been able to manage a lot of uh, basically been able to manage being in the public because being out in public is a very vulnerable and scary thing sometimes. Thank you to Allbirds for sponsoring this episode of the Running For All podcast. Now you have heard me talking about Allbirds, how they want to just make better choices, do things that uh, have been done in the past in a better way. They are a carbon neutral company um, and they are funding high impact carbon projects to, in addition to natural materials to make that a reality. But before they do that, they get the footprint of each item that they make so that they have the whatever kilogram of carbon um, per item. And then they are able to reduce that to make it carbon neutral. Now, I've been talking about the carbon footprint, how we need to start talking about this and how we how we need clothing brands to uh, really own their number. And that's where they're going to be able to make a difference by cutting that down. But today I want to talk to you about one specific thing. I've talked about Allbirds as a whole. I've also, you've probably seen that I've been doing lots of Allbirds events lately. And I want to say, if you have not been to one of the Allbirds events and I'm coming to a place near you, these are so inclusive and empowering and supportive. I am absolutely loving the the diversity and the richness of the stories and the people that are coming to these events. Every event I do with all birds, everyone walks away feeling empowered and strong and just connected. These are beautiful events. So if you have the opportunity, if you are going to be in Chicago on October um, 7th, come to the all birds event on that evening. You can find out more in my, um, in my social media. And if you are going to be, if you are in San Francisco, there's also an event on the 13th I would love for you to attend. And finally, if you're going to be at the New York Marathon, there is going to be an event on the 5th, uh, the 4th, sorry, of uh, November. So I would love to see you there. Find out more in the newsletter. But anyway, I want to talk to you today about the women's performance sports bra. This bra I wore at the Venice Beach event a few weeks ago. Honestly, one of the best bras I've worn in my entire life. It was so supportive, so comfortable. I wore it from 8 a.m. all the way through to 10 p.m. Didn't change, didn't shower, didn't smell. <laughs> and it was so comfortable, very supportive. And uh, I just encourage you to go check it out. You can check out the Women's Performance Sports Bar by going to allbirds.com. It's got this open back to allow maximum airflow. It's got removable cups, but not the cups that keep folding into themselves. Let me just add that. And it's high support enough to be able to handle running. So go check it out at allbirds.com, the women's performance sports bra. Yeah. Uh, and, and thank you for, for the vulnerability that you show by sharing your story and, and, and telling us that, because again, that's another thing it's not easy to do um, and admit that it, that it is hard. Um, so we appreciate you that you do that. And um, so you've, you mentioned earlier that you started your transition in 2010 and from what I calculated, that made, made you 30. Is that right? 
Just before, yep. Just okay. before 30. Yep. So you said that you delayed it for a year and a half uh, to a, uh, for a reason we'll get to in a minute. But being, you know, 29, that's even if you take back that year and a half, that's still 27. That's still pretty far into your life. Uh, but what was your reason for for waiting for waiting that long like was it a um being unsure of who you are was it uh not wanting to take that step for someone who um is just thinking you know you you said at the end of high school you started to to think about this so why did it take till 27 to really even consider it i think i didn't even know that i was trans until just before then and mm -hmm. we're talking about a different time really yes 2010 i was looking for that representation that you're talking about i was looking for anybody who looked like me and all i could see was high school and college kids who were documenting their transition on youtube i didn't see any adults i didn't see people who had been working at a place for five years in their professional career i didn't see any trans men playing sports with men I just, I didn't know that I was possible. And it sounds silly now that we're at a point in, in 2021 where we can turn on TV shows and movies, open magazines, look at covers in the bookstore and see positive representation of trans people. But at that time, it just wasn't there. And so it took me a long time to even learn about trans identity, to learn the word transgender in the, in the meaningful way, as opposed to that jokey way to say, oh, wow, like this is a possibility and then to explore that idea with myself. So I think that was the, really, it was just that even through college, I didn't know I was trans. I didn't know that I could transition. I didn't know it was a possibility and it, it just, everybody's process is on their own time. And I think that's really important to note that you're never too old to be who you were truly meant to be. A lot of us don't transition for a variety of reasons, family, work, you know, support, financial, all sorts of stuff. Uh, safety being probably yes. the most important of that. But I think that it's important to to just know that you can be who you are, and it's not transition is not just something for kids. It's it's you know certainly I think about what my life would have been like had I done it earlier, and like what would my life have been like if I would have gone through college, identifying as a trans man or identifying as male and just having that experience that I thought I should have had. Mm. But I, I'm, I'm really grateful that I've had the experiences that I had because I think it puts me in a position with this really unique perspective of being raised and socialized as female, competing in sports as a woman, and then transitioning to male, seeing how differently I'm treated, seeing all of the, the harms that are done to women in sports and yep. the things that I, that I was experiencing that I didn't couldn't put words to as a young female athlete. And I think it just gives me this really unique perspective about, about gender, about power, about masculinity and femininity, and about positioning in the world, privilege, and all of those things that can help me be a better advocate. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I think that has definitely come across in, in all the interviews that you have done. The, the perspective that you have is, is unique and hopefully won't be as unique in the future as there are other people who um, are able to come out and, and, and get their stories uh, in a public light as well. So uh, mm. I intend to be someone doing that, but hopefully there's more people along the way as well. Um, so you said, uh, we, I mentioned about delaying it a year and a half um, mm -hmm. and you were terrified your sport would be taken away. So when you did decide to make that transition, was was it that you'd come to peace with if I can't compete um, in triathlon in running, then that's okay? Or at that time, was it that you just trusted that something would work out? I don't think I ever thought that it would work out. Like I just wasn't sure, but I don't think I, I couldn't have gone another season another year another however long of time I, I couldn't have made it to my next birthday living the life that i was living and that was basically what it came down to is that the the discomfort and the the distress that i was feeling in the rest of my life outside of sports made it so that i i had to say okay well if, if this is the trade-off if i have to lose sports in order to yeah. be my authentic self then I wasn't at peace with that, but I thought that that's just what has to happen. And I was going to fight for my 
ability to compete in sports and I was going to to do everything I could. But I think at that point, I just kind of had to throw my hands up and say, this is the more important part here. Like this 95% of my life outside of sports really needs to be in alignment with who I am because I just can't take it anymore. Sure. And and thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I actually uh, was watching a show the other day, uh, a few weeks ago, about, um, <laughs> I can't even remember what it was called. It was one of those weird, quirky programs about uh, things people do. Like there was the, they featured the people that chase the cheese down the hill in England. Have you heard of that? <laughs> no. The wheel of cheese. Um, so there's this... <laughs> I, <laughs> There's Where are you this, going with this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to explain that now because now people are going to be confused, including you. So there's this wheel of cheese that is about, I don't even know how much weight it would be, like the size of a laptop wheel of cheese mm-hmm. that people take to the top of this really steep hill in England and they roll it down the hill and people chase the cheese down this really steep hill (laughs) and they end up just like falling down the hill and it's who can get to the bottom fast wins the roll of cheese and the recognition of being I kind of I think it's just called the annual cheese roll but anyway it was featuring (laughs) stuff like this and there was one uh, week where they were featuring people who eat really really spicy foods like these crazy people who have decided that they want to make the spiciest peppers on the planet and they mm-hmm. sit there and their job is like fusing these really spicy peppers together to make uh, you have had of i can't even remember what the name of the really spicy one that people know of ghost not ghost pepper there's a name for it anyway it's like a thousand times spicier than that anyway so there was there was a a a transgender woman on there and she was saying that for her she can do this because um the pain she felt from the chilies was nothing compared to the pain she felt from her life, from the way people treated her on a daily bit basis. And that was what she mm. uses to, or used to channel her uh, competitiveness within this chili eating competition world, which is this whole world of people <laughs> that do it. Um, so I've definitely said those words before. That's, that's yeah. basically, I, I mean, that is an exact quote. People could go watch it on my Instagram story right now. It's a, I just said this in a Gatorade thing that, that the pain that I felt every day in my life was nothing compared to doing an Ironman, like, or an Ironman was nothing compared to that pain, I should say. So when I was doing my first Ironman, I was like, this is nothing. Like I signed up for this. This is, I paid money for this. Actually, this is nothing compared to just trying to live my life every day. I I feel that so much. That's and I should say that's yeah. not, a, you know, not, not every trans person is going to have that narrative. Right. But, but for, for some of us, that's really going to resonate that, it, that our experience is just painful. Yeah. And I think that really brings it home, doesn't it? Because uh, I mean, for, for the listeners out there, think about that in your life, that if the, the one hour that you're doing sport, when you're pushing as hard as you possibly can is for you, the listener, the the, I don't know, the, the hardest part of your day. But imagine having that level of, of struggle and kind of um, fight internally going on most of the day, if not all of the day, just because of the way people treat you and then the way you treat yourself if you're still early on in, in what's going on. So my goal here is to really get people to just stop and think and pause this recording if you need to, to just think about your own life and think about the people that we are talking about here and um, some of the things that people like Chris and other people may have to go through. Um, so related to sport, you um, challenged uh, the policy um, at the IOC to result in the creation and adoption of some new guidelines uh, of participation for transgender athletes. So that was in 2015. We're now in mm-hmm. 2021. Do you feel we've come further since that time or slipped backwards? Because there's a lot more discussion happening in the media, but is that has that been good generally or not? Well, it depends on what bucket we're talking about, right? So I would say since since 2016, in the United States specifically, politically, we've we've gone backwards. And yeah. I think this is a I'm bro- I'm, mm. I'm 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 sweeping with a, a very broad brush here, but in terms of trans policies and the rules around transgender people, our access to housing, uh, 
protections for young people in, in schools, the military. There were a number of harms committed by this previous administration, hopefully very soon previous administration, against the trans community. There was a very targeted effort to start to ban trans people from public life. And that was a top-down presidential initiative. It, it went through you know, the Department of Education, Homeland Security, all of these different areas. Things came out about trans people not being allowed to access certain care, certain programs, and, and certain protections. And so I think that is a, a big step backwards. Sport-wise, we've seen many more st states have high school policies and yeah. they vary between good policies and and mediocre policies and some that are restrictive but we're seeing more states have policies and then national governing bodies so you know in 2010 when i was coming out i had to write to the the running league that i was a running group that i was a part of i had to write to new york road runners i had to write to a national governing body to say hey I'm trans. I want to switch categories. How do I do this? Because there were no policies that were written down at that time. And now since the IOC new guidance came out, many of the national governing bodies have adopted that policy as their own to, to be in line with that. Some have not. Some have much more restrictive policies and they're allowed to do that until the Olympic level competition and then they'd have to follow the IOC. But I've, I think that generally speaking, I've seen more inclusive policies that I've been able to track on transathlete.com. Mm -hmm. And I think then, you know, going back to sort of this political and social piece, we've had the, the swing backwards again in the targeting of transgender athletes and trans people in healthcare, uh, in, in their access to healthcare at the state level. And so last year in, in the 2020 legislative session, we've had 36 different bills that were targeting trans people and wow. in 19 different states and many of them were targeting transgender high school and collegiate student athletes and so there's been this sort of you know it's, it's kind of all 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 over across the board you know in the media in in terms of public image i think we're moving in a positive direction we're seeing positive representation we're seeing celebration of achievements we're seeing uh more representation more people can look and see someone like themselves in the media represented in a positive way mm -hmm. or it, telling their story in their own voice but in terms of that sort of political and and legislative piece i think we're going to be fighting these harms for many years to come mm -hmm. so that said isn't with i mean for me uh, as you may know but my list is different uh the environmental climate change uh, narrative is the thing that I am most passionate about speaking about and being an activist mm -hmm. for. But um, with that, we've seen that I've, I've heard people say that you, you get the media um, changing the narrative, you get people talking, the public to change their opinion and to support changes. And then the politicians will fall in line. Do you, do you agree with that in, in, in this instance? Yeah, I, it happens both ways, right? It, change can happen from the bottom up or from the top down. And really, that's that's it, right? So you have people on the streets rallying, saying, this is what we demand. This is what we expect from our government. This is what we want. And certainly, people have to pay attention to that. But there's there what I, what I learned last year in going to Idaho to meet with lawmakers in advance of the worst anti-trans bill in the country coming out and becoming law was that... No matter how much you think that they're listening, there are lobbyists and, and yeah. corporations and companies and groups that have a lot of money that have a lot of influence. And so it's not necessarily that all politicians are, are acting in the will of the people, acting in the best interest or in the interest of the people that they're representing. And that was a hard truth for me to learn last year. I, I thought that w what we saw was that a majority of the people were against that bill becoming law. And you know, then it comes down to a couple of people and, and their vote and and certainly lobbyist money and, and things like that behind it. So you know, I'm not sure. I think that if we had lawmakers who were passionate about this as well, I think that we could see change happen pretty quickly and then people would have to adapt and adopt that. But 
certainly changing public opinion is a wonderful way to get change to happen because that will inspire people to, to stand up and to speak out and say, this is not what we want. That We want equality. We want people to be treated fairly. We want you know, people to be treated with dignity and respect. And this does not align with our values. Thank you to Athletic Greens for sponsoring this episode of the Running For All podcast. Now, you've heard me talking about Athletic Greens for years now. It allows you to say goodbye to piles of pills and countless powders. One daily serving of AG1 delivers this potent blend of nine health products, a multivitamin, minerals, probiotics, adaptogens, and more. It's the comprehensive foundational nutrition you need with the convenience for your life demands. Now, that applies to me in a way I cannot even describe. With two young kids, I know I should be getting 27 different fruits and vegetables in a day, but honestly, some days I'm lucky if I can get one or two at dinner. And it is difficult for me to take care of myself with just this hectic life that I live. So while I want to make these green juices every morning, uh, you know, with a, with a juicer machine, with the kale and the ginger and the lemon and all those other things. I just don't have the time for it. I can't, I can barely get to stuff something down my throat to eat. And uh, I love that I can wake up before the girls wake up, drink down my uh, one scoop of Athletic Greens with ice cold water, drink it down, know that I've got 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients to start my day. So that even if that day ends up being hectic and running around all over the place, I know I've got that in. It tastes good. It's almost a slight pineapple-y taste. I love drinking it before I run. I drink it and go immediately out the door. It's going to help with your gut health. It's going to support your immunity. It's going to boost your energy and help with recovery. What more can you ask for with one scoop? So you can go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. You will get five free travel packs and a one year free supply of vitamin D3 and K2. Now, as we head into the winter months, that is when we need that vitamin D and it works well with the K3 as well to absorb better. We need those to protect us from all the nasty sicknesses that are coming around. So be sure to go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina to go check out my special offer and stop stressing about not getting those fruits and vegetables in this is going to take care of you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And do you ever feel exhausted with this situation? I mean, much in the same way that the conversation last year uh, about racism and just this uh, upheaval of, uh, you know, BIPOC, the BIPOC community having to constantly speak out and, and tailor to white people and say the same thing over and over again. I mean, I feel this way again with the environmental movement that sometimes it feels hopeless and, and it's hard. You say about the lobbyist, it's hard to even see beyond that when mm -hmm. um, you feel like all your efforts are, it just takes a few powerful people to just destroy all, everything that, that the public could care about or work for. So do you ever feel that sense of, oh, I just don't know if I have the energy to, to keep to keep fighting for this. Those moments are very few and far between, and they fortunately are very short because I see that even when I'm exhausted, when I'm exhausted is probably the time that, that I need to show up the most. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that it's important for me to balance self-care and taking care of my own mental, you know, space and well-being and protect myself in this, but also know that, that I, you know, think about like, why am I doing this? What is, what is my purpose in being outspoken in you know, speaking out against certain harms of communities that, 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 that won't ever, ever affect me. Like the Idaho policy doesn't affect yeah. me, but, but it does, it affects the way that trans people, it affects my community. And, and I want to show up and be of service. I want to do the most good that I can. And I want to be that representation for people that, that, that they're looking to see that person that I needed when I was younger and I didn't mm -hmm. see. And that sort of positioning, that, that reset, that keeping that in mind helps me push through those harder moments. You know, I think the hardest moment that I had was waking up the day after the 2016 election because I knew what was going to happen then. I knew that our, our community would just be carrying a huge bullseye and it would be four years of targeted attacks against us. And I wasn't wrong. <laughs> it happened mm -hmm. and it happened pretty early on, you know, actually started pretty early on with 
the White House wiping out the entire page about LGBTQ initiatives, erased the entire history and erased everything about the queer community on on the page as soon as he came into office. And that was a that was a pretty clear flag that we were mm-hmm. going to be up against uh, some problems. I woke up that day going, "What is my like? Does it even matter that I'm fighting for people in sport?" We're going to have people who are going to be out of jobs, who aren't going to be able to find employment, who are going to be kicked out of their housing, who are going to be harassed and discriminated against in in ways that are physically violent. Does it even matter that I want trans people to play sports? And then what I figured out was that, you know, my activism in this area is really, you know, sport is a vehicle for social change outside of the quarter of the field. Yeah. We've seen sport lead social movements. And I think sport is one of those things that everybody can sort of relate into that. Even if you're not an athlete, you follow a team or you know somebody in sports or it's you know something that people talk about at the water cooler when they used to go to offices and <laughs> water coolers were a thing. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's one of those things that that binds us together regardless of our other differences. And I know that that is the way that I can help achieve social change is by working through that. So any fatigue that I feel can pretty quickly be gotten over when keeping that in mind. Yeah, thank you. And then so related to that, do you do you feel that overall people are good? Are are people good? Yeah, like do you feel inherently that just every person is is trying to do their their absolute best and um some people have just got a bit lost along the way? I I don't know that everyone is actually trying to do their best all the time. And I think that when I see those people, I feel, I feel sorry for those people. Like I feel, I feel sad for those folks because I, when I, when people come at me with hate and negativity, I I just want to say like, who hurt you? Like, I'm so sorry that, that you're having this experience because I think a lot of the discrimination and harassment that I receive, and I should note that this is as a trans man, which is very different than the hate and discrimination that transgender women receive, not just in the world, but also in sport. You know, I, I carry with me this privilege of being, you know, perceived as a man, treated as a man. And that with it kind of protects me from some of the discrimination, I guess. When people harass me or say things to me, I just, I know that it says more about them than it does about me. And my (laughs) response is usually, you know, try to, um, try to give them kindness and, and, and love and empathy of saying like, sorry that, that you're having a bad day <laughs> or that this is happening and try to help them understand, you do that educational piece. And that's, you know, some of them don't deserve a response. They're clearly trying to provoke and inflame, mm-hmm. but yeah, I, I, w- I guess I would like to believe that, that we all have the c- capacity to be good, to do good. And some people are just hurting so badly that yep. you know that can't see that beyond are, the pain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, you mentioned there about um, the difference between a trans man and a trans woman, and uh, my uh, friend Carly actually asked me to ask you about this um, herself because she um, she is. I hope she. Uh, she has given me permission to say this, but uh, she is transitioning right now and um, is kind of uh, undergoing a lot of the um, acceptance and and conversations with her family um, Mm -hmm. and just uh, very much in the thick of it right now. Um, She mentioned to me to ask you about, yeah, the difference between uh, a man and a woman in terms of, I mean, I have to think there's some element of, of transitioning to be a man, something about the role a man has in our society compared to the the woman have you thought on a on a deep level about why it is that trans men are more accepted compared to trans women oh of course i have <laughs> now i have you know yeah. when i was thinking about transition this is like one thing that no one told me about i had no idea that these sort of social changes would happen in interactions i i knew what would happen if i took testosterone i knew you know, at a certain point, I uh, worked through and figured out what would happen in sports and, and how I would be able to compete. I figured out how to navigate interactions with family and friends that I had to tell. Mm-hmm. 
but I was not at all prepared for the way that just society in general would treat me as a man because being raised and socialized as a young woman, I just, you know, kind of got used to being talked down to. And I saw at a very early age that the way that my coaches treated me versus the way they treated my brother in sports was very different, but I didn't know what that was. And, you know, now I have this lens to look back and say like, you know, it's, there's so much sexism rooted in, in the fabric of our society that we are just unaware of. We've just accepted as truth, as fact. So me transitioning from an androgynous presenting woman, you know, who was trying to be invisible or who was largely made invisible if, unless people were harassing me to then transitioning to being perceived as a straight white man, you know, I just basically received all my privilege cards in, yeah. in one hand. And, you know, then it became apparent to me going to lunch with my boss, who was an incredible woman, she would pay the bill and the check would come back to me or walking into a bodega in New York city with my friend who is black and being addressed first, you know, and, and like situation after situation like that, where I could see, you know, the privilege of whiteness, of maleness, of straightness all sort of come up. And the way that this has played out is like, I know how women are treated in sports because I was treated that way. We weren't yeah. given the same playing time. We got the, the hand-me-down uniforms. We had second rate equipment. We had this, you know, the, the junkie bus going to games on and on and on. You know, we celebrated the men's team and then the women's team got a brief mention. You know, that sort of thing happened time and time again. And now I see in terms of acceptance, like when I transitioned to male, no one assumed that I would be competitive with men because I was assigned female at birth. There's the sexism that no person who was assigned female at birth could ever be competitive with men. And so I was just sort of written off, given a shrug. And it's been to my benefit because people largely, <laughs> unless there's mm. an article like yesterday, don't harass me. And a lot of the comments on the article yesterday are curious about which way I'm transitioning. And so when people are assuming I'm actually a trans woman who was assigned male at birth, then the harassment is exponentially worse. And so, you know, in me making Team USA, I got a thumbs up, a good job, shrug, and not a big deal. And when we see trans women who just want to participate in sport, like trying to just join a league, they're faced with such discrimination and harassment. And, you know, it's, it's a completely different situation. And it's exacerbated by the fact that, you know, women's bodies have been policed for a very long time in sport. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And many of the people that we're seeing publicly harassed and, and targeted in the media in terms of women athletes who are transgender also happen to be black and brown athletes. And so there's yeah. this component of racism that's that's layered on top of the sexism, of the transphobia, and it really makes for a, a really ugly situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're, we're definitely seeing that. You mentioned a bit in the media, there's, there's been a lot of that. And um, I, I'd like to delicately talk about this, just for, for someone who has only ever seen the other side of this and um i just want to give them the chance to understand and and hear from someone as to a different perspective but someone who their child is uh their child is an athlete who uh, a female um, athlete who is in high school and she uh has been really good and she's been winning things um but then now there's this um transgender female that's that's come into the sport and this new girl is winning everything uh now that is obviously in a, in a teenage girl going to provoke some insecurities anyway because you know we all like to win and we don't like when uh, we, uh when we're not winning anymore it can be tough to deal with at the best of times let alone when you're a teenager but um just just put the other side of the perspective here of um for all those people who say yeah but um you know, um, a, a young high school girl is not going to be six, four, um, and able to just, just physically be so different to my daughter who is competing right now. What would you say to those people who have only really, you know, are maybe on the other side of that media, uh, the media coverage that we are seeing? 
Yeah, this other side, though, you know, it, it just kind of doesn't exist. And so uh, there's mm-hmm. deep problems with even having this conversation right now. But we're going to yeah. we're going to pick it apart so that people know what the problems are. This I mean, basically what you laid out is just a stereotype. It's a myth. Yeah. It's the it's the greatest fear of the people who are creating these bills to, quote unquote, protect women's sport. Mm-hmm. Right. And so. It's making the assumption that first, anyone assigned male at birth will be bigger, faster, stronger, or a better athlete than somebody assigned female at birth. But you said that a young girl isn't going to be 6'4", but I I think that I could log on and, and watch any NCAA volleyball match and see 6'4 women. I could see 6'4 women in basketball in high school. And while it's far less common, they're out there, and it doesn't mean that they're no longer a woman when they hit six, three and three quarters, right? Like, like there's not a, there's not a cutoff for that. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that athletes come in different sizes, shapes, body structures, types, abilities, and athletes receive different support. And this goes back to that sexism in sport of young girls not being given the same opportunities as young boys in sport. Right. And I think that's part of the fear is that people think that I mean, it's, it's kind of gross to think that people think that there is a limit of how good a girl could be before she's no longer a girl. Mm -hmm. So there's already a ceiling that we put in place to say that, that young women and girls can only be so good in sport and they can never hold their own in sport against a trans woman. And the problem in that is, is that people aren't using the phrasing of trans woman, or if they are, it's secretly coded in saying that's a boy playing a girl's sport. That's a boy playing with girls or that's a man playing with women. And that's the problem. That's the part that gets us killed, right? Is saying that we're not who we say we are. We're not uh, that, you know, saying that I'm not a trans man, that I'm a woman playing men's sports. And that, that part doesn't even bother people, right? Because like when we're talking about bathrooms and locker rooms, no one cares what locker room I'm using. But I think that actually cisgender women would care if I walked into a women's locker room. But that's not the part that we're talking about. We're talking about trans women being in women's spaces. And so there, you know, this whole part about trans men kind of being scooped out of the conversation because it like my story of being competitive with men doesn't align with the fears that people have. Right. It doesn't yeah. it doesn't help support this argument that there's going to be some sort of takeover in women's sports, that women's sports is going to be in danger. But the truth is we don't have to choose between fairness and safety in sport and welcoming transgender athletes on our teams. It's a false choice. We don't have to do that. If we want to really strengthen and transform women's sports and our access to opportunities, we have to address the real barriers to equity and understand that the attack on trans athletes has come from this place of sexism of holding all women and girls back. And so, you know, I don't think it's helpful to go through these situations of saying like this potential takeover, you know, honestly, I've never met a trans woman who's gotten a scholarship in college for sports. I've never met a trans athlete who's gotten a college scholarship in women's sports. Because they haven't got, they haven't got to the level of where they would be given one or, or they are that good and still not given one. You know, I'm not sure, but, but I think this is the fear, right? Is like, this is what we've heard about this whole, uh, you know, in the running community. So I'm I'm assuming many of your listeners are runners, right? And that, that they may be aware of the lawsuit in Connecticut that was uh, largely based on two young trans girls who were running in Connecticut who did well at state, but, you know, when we got to the national championship, uh, the one went uh, got 31st and 32nd in her races and the other one didn't even compete, you know, and, and there's this narrative of domination of takeover. Trans women have been able to compete in the Olympics for over 19 years. And we have not seen a single openly trans woman make it to the Olympics yet, let alone medal. Like people, you know, if I, I just always kind of laugh. Like if there was this takeover, yeah. That was going to happen. When is it going to happen? <laughs> in the in the twenty first year of it being a policy, like I just don't understand. So this is all of you know your question, your phrasing of this, your framing of this is based on what right leaning news sources are framing up as the danger to women's sports. Yeah, but it's all theoretical. And every once in a while, we may have a an athlete who is a good athlete who has found their sport who may do well. 
but we have not seen this widespread domination. We have not seen cis girls and women being kicked out of their positions, losing their own scholarships like that. Just it just hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're so right. Thank you for explaining that. And, um, uh, you know, that's a good example of um, uh, so something I need to work on as well in 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 the way of of bringing things up and and thinking about the the approach that I am taking. Not that I agreed with that um, those lawsuits or any of that, but um, mm -hmm. this is definitely something that <laughs> is difficult for me to to understand how to to bring about. And so, thank you for clarifying clarifying that uh, for me as well. Yeah, and um, I just want to you know relate to you yeah. and to your to your listeners. Like, mm -hmm. this is something like I I understand why people want answers to these questions, right? Because if, if the fear was particularly, I think in if, for folks who are even older than I am, right. Who, who worked hard in the title nine, you know, fight it to establish women's sports as something that was taken seriously. That was an option for young girls and women to be able to play sports. Like we have to remember that it wasn't that long ago that people thought a woman's uterus would fall out if she ran a marathon. Right. We've got like, so, so if you think about that being in our parents' lifetimes, that we're not too far into women's sports being established. And we know that women's sports gets 4% of media coverage on the whole yeah. of all sports, that, that women are severely underpaid. We've had such strong female athletes like the national women's soccer team stand up for pay equity. You know, we've had people speak out. We've had the WNBA leading the charge on social justice and initiatives of across all sports leagues, but not given the recognition they deserve and on and on and on, you know. And so I understand this, you know, protection of women's sports idea in theory, but what it when we target trans women and girls, it hurts all women in sports. Yeah. And just to bring it back to policy in the HB 500 in Idaho, this law now says that any young girl can be questioned about her identity and it would trigger an investigation, which would include a potential genital examination, oh my God. examination of their chromosomes and of their hormones. So I think about myself being a good basketball player at age 15 with a great jump shot and I could jump up and touch mm -hmm. the rim. And people saying, that's a man. That was the discrimination and the harassment that I got when I was in high school. It would either be homophobic slurs or that's a man. Despite how I looked, you know, looking just like my, you know, in the same uniform, long hair, ponytail with my peers, not nothing surface different, right? That was the harassment that I got. But now someone could say that to a young girl a 15 year old and trigger a pelvic examination, internal and external genital examination to determine if she was actually a girl so that she could play college or high school sports. And that, that to me is what's really gross about this. And that's what, when we continue to bring up these narratives about trans people, not being who they say they are about, uh, you know, misgendering people and, you know, trying to ban trans people from sport. It's all women and girls and all people who, who suffer from this. For sure. Yeah. Thank you. And, and the narrative we've been talking about over the last year with, in terms of um, racism applies to this as well with um, if, if we get, it get to equality for everyone, all, uh, what is it? A rising tide lifts all boats. Um, mm -hmm. it, it helps everyone to, to find that level um, of equality and, you know, we know it is essentially an impossible perfection to get there uh, as a whole, but we can we can keep working towards it. And so, let's give something actionable. What can the listeners do um, to uh, to make a change within their own lives? Uh, I mean, conversations. I'm assuming are a big part of them. Um, and same with racism. Correcting someone if they if they uh, do say something that is is hurtful or harmful. Uh, but what else would you encourage people to do? Yeah, a lot of the concepts of allyship that many of us learned over the summer and fall about racial justice and, and standing up for equality in that capacity definitely apply here. And I think, you know, we had mentioned at the top, like conversations are difficult about mm -hmm. this. Like it, 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 it can be tough to have these conversations with friends and specifically with family. But having the language and terminology is a good first step. And so 
I suggest that everybody goes to my website, transathlete.com and reads the terminology list. Terminology in the trans community changes all the time, like, like many communities about labels and words that fit and don't fit and are outdated. And so, you know, even like talking about sport policy, the NCAA policy uses outdated language. It's, mm -hmm. it's not, it's, it's offensive to read now, but when it was written in 2010, it was cutting edge. And so even going back to your podcast with Amelia, there may be things that have changed in terms yeah. of language. And so, you know, not necessarily about personal experience, but about terminology. So there's a terminology page on my website, transathlete.com. And then going back to the top that a good first place for people to start is just thinking about unpacking their own stuff that they learned. What were the earliest messages that you got about trans people? And a good way to do that is to use disclosure on yes. Netflix as a as a sort of starting point for those conversations. There were things in there that I saw that I was like, oh, wow, I remember that on TV. And I didn't even think about how that impacted me. Yeah, I would imagine I would imagine that was the case with many people. I mean, they put together such a big, wide collection of uh, clips that it really, really brought it home. I don't know how anyone could not come out of watching that without thinking differently. It really mm -hmm. was very eye opening for everyone I've spoken to who has watched it. Uh, now, final thing I want to ask you about. Um, in 2020, you became the uh, first openly transgender male athlete to compete in, in an Olympic trial, uh, but you had to pull out with injury. Uh, were you ever able to be kind to yourself for that? Or was there any pressure on you knowing what that moment represented to, com to the community? Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's sad, right? It, injury is tough for everybody. And I think it's a learning process. I think in a lot of ways, it's a blessing for us. I've always come back stronger from injury. So I'm, I'm grateful for it. But my goal actually was to make it to the Olympic trials. And for the listeners, I, I made it in race walking, which was a new sport for me. I started it last year. I did two races and qualified for the Olympic or got into the Olympic trials and, you know, did the Olympic trials, uh, did pull out with a torn meniscus. And I was really trying to like, my goal was to check that box. I wanted to show up at the Olympic trials to break that barrier and, you know, open that door for the next person who comes after me. So mm -hmm. I was, I was bummed. I was really grateful. I had the experience. It was awesome to go and just to be a part of it. And, you know, I don't, I don't think it'll be my last time, uh, you know, on a stage of that nature. So I am grateful for the experience. Uh, it checked the box and it, you know, broke that barrier for our community. And I think you know, whether it's me or another athlete who takes that next step, I am just thrilled that, 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 that pathway is there now. Does any part of the way I said that or the way that it's reported bother you in terms of, you know, I mentioned about the injury and I noticed every article on you that mentioned you doing that said, uh, Mosia did not finish due to injury that, there was a need to qualify it with that as if you were expected to go do it and then finish fifth or something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> part of you bother that bother that they like, there's a need to mention the injury injury aspect. Um, I think initially there was one article, uh, even within the LGBTQ reporting that was, you know, set that highlighted or put the focus on me not being able to finish. And I called them out on that. I thought that that was a pretty poor way to report mm -hmm. the, that historic moment. Yeah. Um, but that's the truth of it, right? I didn't finish the race. I also tore my meniscus. I wasn't going to finish <laughs> yeah. that race. So, so if that's what people want to focus on, fine. Focus on that. It, like I'm, I'm unfazed. It's fine. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I admire you for so many. Your just approach. So many things that we talked about in this in this episode. Your gentleness. Your kindness with with me, with the listeners, with the same things that you must get over and over. Uh, is there anything else you want to tell our listeners before uh, we part ways? Yeah, let's just go back to that top part. You don't know what you don't know. And I'm just so grateful that people would stick around and listen to this and hopefully expand their curiosity and their understanding. Uh, you know, with, with the word curiosity, I'll say that it is not transgender people's responsibility to satisfy the curiosities of cisgender folks. And so uh, same thing for non-binary people. There are incredible resources online or chat with your friends, watch movies, you know, 
trans people, while I've made it my job to, to be the mm-hmm. source of answers for a lot of people, and that's something that I kind of, you know, like, that's my mission is that I make it easier for everyone who comes after me. And that if I can answer questions on your podcast that will help people have a better understanding, then maybe I've avoided some sort of awkward interaction or or hurtful question for the next trans person. And that to me is a win. But not all of us are taking this on as our responsibility. And so, you know, use your resources, uh, but also don't be afraid to engage with trans people and and ask questions, uh, respectful questions. The biggest thing is probably thinking about why you need to know that information. And if it's not something you'd ask any other person in the room, probably don't ask a trans person. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but don't underestimate the impact that you can have in anyone else's life by by you know engaging, by doing the effort to stand up and be an ally, to speak out, to not let transphobic or homophobic phrases or jokes just slide. Uh, because we all we all have an impact, and whether you have a large platform, a podcast, or not, you have a social circle, you have friends, you have coworkers, and you can make an influence by being a good ally in those spaces that can have a profound impact down the road. So everybody has a role to play, whether it's in transphobia, homophobia, racial justice, you know, sexism, all of these things that we're battling against in this in this mm-hmm. time. Uh, you know, just keep showing up. Yeah, thank you. Great words to finish off there. I appreciate you and all that you've done. Um, where can people go find you? I am Trans mostly, yeah, so transathlete.com, like singular athlete, uh, is my is my webpage with policies and resources about trans inclusion in sport and the inclusion of non-binary people in sport. And so for policies and recommendations and just general information and as well as the sort of legislation that's coming up and the bills that we're fighting all of that information is there i'm the chris Mosier on instagram where i mostly follow or do my training and my advocacy work and twitter and kind of everything the chris Mosier and the chris com for speaking and all of that stuff okay well thank you so much i appreciate you and um yeah just thank you so much for for sharing with us today i'm so glad we made it happen thanks for having me The Running For Real podcast and everything we do here at Running For Real would not be possible if it wasn't for the Running For Real team. While I am the person who you hear from most often and maybe the face of the brand, the rest of our team are such critical pieces of what we do. And without them, I think I'd just be running around in circles with ideas. So I want to take a moment to thank our team. To Jeremy Nessel, who's been with me since the very beginning. Kat McKay. Sally Pontarelli, Kelsey Wang, Sandy Gutierrez, Louise Murphy, Andrew Basola, Alexandria Will, and Maria Vargas. Thank you to each and every one of you for all that you give to Running For Real and our community. I appreciate you, and I'm so thankful for having you as a part of the team. Isn't he awesome? I am so thankful for this guy. So thankful for all he can share with us and and just the work he is putting in. I mean, he is really doing all he can to not just help people within the trans community, but people all across the board, making sure things are fair for everyone. Just such a good advocate, so wise and um I really enjoyed talking to him. I definitely intend on having Chris back on the show. And and, um, if you enjoyed this episode, I would love if you could share it. Now, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. You can check out Gooda by going to gooda.com forward slash Tina and you will get 15% off your order. You can also get 20% off at livemomentous.com using code Tina20. And you can get... um, 20% 20% off your order at you can that remember I mentioned that new granola that they have out by going to you can.co and using code Tina you can for 20% off your order there and finally I want to mention a few days ago the new tra- the trailer for my new podcast which I'm hosting with Knox Robinson came out our new show running realized is coming out in just a few weeks we are really excited about it go check out the trailer you can find it by searching running realized 
playlist in your favorite podcast player. You will will be able to find it there and uh, go subscribe so that when the episode drops, it is there ready for you. This podcast is unlike any other podcast in the running space. We are really excited about it and putting in four, five, six times the amount of work per episode as I would typically put in for Running For Real, but I know it is worth it. I genuinely believe this podcast is going to be a game changer. So go look for Running Realized in your favorite podcast player and go subscribe. Thank you so much for listening, my friends. I'll see you next week. 